Yes, with my voice on it. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about hematology. You guys all knew who I am. You all know what I'm about. And as Rodney has already doctored on this lecture, because that's why you don't put things in Dropbox, also known as Big Sexy. Although I've found out that there are more real Big Sexies out there in the world now. So I'm not the only one, unfortunately. So I'm going to be over here so I can record as well. So Everybody can see and hear me, I'm assuming. So I'm doing a few things at once here because my recording I did last night did not take, so we've got to re-record this lecture. You guys all hear me? Where I'm recording right here into my laptop. I got my laptop up. No, it's not those. So you guys can make your little subtle comments over there. Nobody's gonna hear you. Okay. So we're going to talk about anatomy and physiology of hematology, general assessment, management, and managing specific patient populations and problems. What is hematology? Okay, the study of blood and what? And blood, blood and the blood forming organs. Okay. Um, if you've ever heard of a hematologist, the hematologist is a physician that deals with blood. A hematologist is a physician that typically deals with cancer as well. So hematology and oncology go hand in hand. So the study of blood and blood forming organs include the study of blood disorders. We've got disorders with the red blood cells. Give me an example of a red blood cell disorder. Anemia. Give me an example of a white blood cell disorder. Okay, what type of cancer? There you go, leukemia. All right. Platelet disorders. Uh, thrombocytopenia, maybe. Okay. Coagulation problems. Hemophilia. Uh, we're going to talk about all of those. We can go through these. Okay. So the anatomy and physiology and pathophysiology, the components of blood. We've got blood, bone marrow, liver, spleen, and kidneys. All of these have an essential and important function to blood and blood formation and the actual use of the blood. Obviously, the blood is blood. And what are the components of blood? Give me some examples of some components. Plasma. Hemoglobin that's attached to the red blood cells. Okay. White blood cells. Thrombocytes or platelets. All right, then we have all the other stuff like vitamins and minerals and electrolytes that float around in the blood. So, the bone marrow. Where is blood produced? In the bone marrow. Bone marrow kicks out the blasts that are going to eventually become, or the stem cells, the hem hemopoietic stem cells, that are eventually going to become blood cells. Whether they become a white blood cell or a red blood cell. Realize that red blood cells can only come from the bone marrow. White blood cells have the ability to undergo mitosis and so forth and do that cell division. Because they have a nucleus. Red blood cells don't have a nucleus. Because when a red blood cell matures, what does it do? It kicks that nucleus out to make room for hemoglobin. And when it kicks that nucleus out and makes that room for hemoglobin, then it loses its ability to be able to recreate, reproduce. Liver. Liver important for blood? It, it filters, right? And also most of your clotting factors come from the liver. The liver is where those clotting factors come from. The spleen. What is the spleen? Well, it's kind of like a reservoir. It's kind of a storage tank. Think of it like a tank battery for, for, for blood. All right? It's got all the cells and all the components there. And the body, remember, is very, very good about recycling itself. It doesn't like to waste things. So when these red blood cells die off and their lifespan is over with, they're going to go back. It's kind of like a chop shop. It's going to take out the hemoglobin. It's going to set those protein molecules aside. It's going to take the iron, set that iron aside, and those other components. So that way it can recreate and rebuild new little new little uh, red blood cells and new cells. Okay? Can you live without your spleen? Yes. Yeah. What will take over if your spleen goes? Your liver. Your liver will kick up, can take over its function. That's where it is. liver does some storage of red blood cells, or blood cells as well. The kidneys. <coughs> How the heck are the kidneys involved with blood? 
They filter everything. All blood goes to the kidneys to be filtered. We get all the crap that we don't need. We got too much sodium, let's get rid of it. We got too many uh, other electrolytes, let's get rid of it. What else? So, what happens whenever I am out and let's say I like have my leg hacked off, but I'm a Boy Scout and all this other stuff, so I get my if we leak for a little bit, I lose you. Let's say I lose two liters of blood. I don't Boy Scout and I'm able to get the bleeding to stop, but I'm stranded out in the middle of nowhere, no medical care. I've bled, I've lost two liters of blood. How am I going to reproduce that blood? And how's the kidneys going to do that? Okay, we're going to retain fluid to initially elevate our blood pressure. And that's kind of how that whole, you guys remember the end, and I ran into angiotensin. Okay. Renin, whenever our blood pressure is low or our kidney sensor, we don't have enough blood flow to the kidney, it's going to produce renin. Renin is going to go up to the lungs. It's going to turn into angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 in the lungs is converted to angio angiotensin 2 by uh, angiotensin converting enzyme. And it, once angiotensin 2 gets produced, it goes down and it gets to the kidney. When it gets back to the kidney again, starts in the kidney, goes back to the kidney, it reduces aldosterone. What is aldosterone? It's a mineral corticoid, which is just a steroid basically, but it's what its job is is to hold on to salt. It'll make you hold on to sodium. By holding on to sodium, what else do you hold on to? Water, which causes a what? Well, it causes an increase in your blood pressure because from that fluid shift if you're holding on to that fluid. Now, aside from that, aldosterone causing us to hold on to that and create and make our blood pressure go up, that's only a temporary fix because we know water can't carry oxygen and those other things. We've got to make more blood cells. So how are we going to create more blood cells? The kidneys have to release another hormone. And what hormone is that? I'll give you a hint. Lance Armstrong. Not testosterone. <laughs> how about erythropoietin? Erythropoietin or EPO gets released. Doping, okay? But EPO gets released, and when EPO gets released, it goes to the bone marrow, and it's going to tell the bone marrow to start kicking out stem cells, red blood cells. That way we can create the whole cycle again, okay? Other things will trigger the release of erythropoietin in the kidneys. Not only does having a low blood volume, but the true factor that really controls that mm -hmm. is hypoxia. That's why. Where do people go to train? High altitudes. If you train at high altitudes, what happens? Well, you basically you're in a you're you're not getting as much saturation. So if you're not getting enough saturation, what happens? You have to start to create more red blood cells because your body wants to try to get those up to have higher levels. All right. That's kind of well, and in the right conditions, we actually create polycythemia. So, um, so clarapoint and stem cell, um, that is what actually gets created in the bone marrow. It's actually going to cause that, um, that release um, that's actually going to mature in to become a, a blood cell. Erythropoietin, we just talked about what erythropoietin does. And that's all regulated by that blood volume. But what is our average blood volume for a person? Five to six liters. Five liters, closer to five liters for a female, six liters for a male. So blood, we have our components of blood. We've got plasma, which is 90, not around 90% water, all right, by volume. And we've got proteins in there, albumin, fibrinogen, and globulin. Albumin. Um, what is albumin? It's not really for clotting. The fibrinogen is for clotting. Albumin is a large molecule, but I will tell you what albumin truly controls in our blood is albumin controls our osmolality. That's what controls that osmotic pool from fluids into the vascular space versus out of the vascular space. That's albumin. That's why when you have patients that are up late up in the ICU two or three weeks after the fact, uh, and they're like on their deathbed, most of the time you have to give them albumin to try to retain that so they don't third-face all their fluids. 
for some of that edema on it. Um, fibrinogen, clotting factor. Uh, fibrinogen is what ties everything together and creates that, that webbing, basically, that's going to fix things. And our globulins, well, globulin, that, that in and of itself should explain to you what it is. Not a goblin, but a globulin. And you think about the word glob. What is glob? It's glue. Okay, and that's what they are. They're just a glue, a protein. All right, and that's why hemoglobin is a globulin. All right, it just sits there. And if you ever look, if you ever had like an electron microscope and you looked at what hemoglobin actually looked like, it looked like a spider web wrapped around a red blood cell. And that's what those globulins are. There's just those different protein structures there that are in that uh, plasma. And then we have about two, two to three percent other stuff. We've got fats in there, carbohydrates. Obviously, we have our electrolytes. We have our gases. Are the gases dissolved in plasma? What's an important gas that gets dissolved in plasma? Okay, so we remember something from, from the summer. Very good. And then we have our chemical messengers, or our hormones, that are transmitted throughout the blood. So we're going to talk about some of the specific cells. Erythrocytes, leukocytes, <coughs> lymphocytes, macrophage, monocyte, eosinophil, neutrophil, basophil, and platelet. All right. So, red blood cell, white blood cells, platelet. Okay. The three types of cells in blood. All right. Red blood cell or erythrocyte. It's easy enough to know what a red blood cell is. We know what red blood cells do. But you need to know that it is called an erythrocyte. How can you remember erythrocyte? Erythra means red, cyte, cell, red cell. All right. Then we have our leukocyte, which is just a generic term for a white <coughs> blood cell. Broken down off of our leukocytes, we have different types of white blood cells. And these white blood cells all have their own specific functions that they utilize. For instance, <coughs> when we talk about the, the lymphocyte, well, you've heard of the lymphatic system. You've heard of lymph nodes. Those are your primary, you have your beta lymphocytes and you have your T lymphocytes. We all probably heard of T cells and B cells. That's what those are. These are truly the guys that fight off infections and our viruses and other things that come in. So based on that, we have T lymphocytes. We all have those when we're kids. And we still have them to this day because, like I said, they have a nucleus, so they're able to reproduce. We have a thymus gland. Our thymus gland kicks those guys out when we're kids, like the candy, so that way we have them. That's what gives us our immunity. All right, as we get older and our thymus gland starts to go away, we still have those T lymphocytes, but now we don't really make T, T cells anymore. We make B cells because we get them from the bone marrow at that point in time. And they're going to have that memory. That's what that has, gives us that memory cell, basically, to know that um, specifically when we talk about like allergic reactions, and antigens come into the body. They're the ones that remember that, that, that antigen and are able to fight it off. But we have our lymphocyte there. We have our macrophages and monocytes. Macrophages are Pac-Men. That's what they are. They sit around and they eat debris. They eat crap. Old tissue that's in the body, they eat that away. Other white blood cells, they eat those. Viruses, bacteria, all that other stuff that comes in, that's what their job is. We have our eosinophil our neutrophil, and our basal, basophil. The eosinophil and the basophil, they're what we call granulocytes. And what they have in them is they have a bunch of chemical mediators in there. They have histamine, heparin, leukotrienes, all of those things that we think about when we think about inflammation are housed inside of those cells. We will see eosinophils are very important when we talk about an anaphylactic reactions. Those are the main mediator for anaphylactic reactions. Basophils also have interaction with anaphylactic reactions, but besides with anaphylactic reactions, basophils also deal with like uh, parasitic in invasions and some other invasions that we get in our body. The neutrophil, our neutrophil on the other hand, is the cell, it's, it's what we think about truly when we think about our white blood cell. We see neutrophils that are very good at fighting off bacteria and other things like that. That's why when we see patients that have infections, we will see a rise in their neutrophil count. Again, these are all just generic terms for white blood cells, but they're specific types of white blood cells. And when we talk about lab value interpretation this afternoon, when we talk about this, this is what's going to kind of guide us when we look at these different subcategories of white blood cells. It's going to kind of tell you what's going on with the patient as to why, why they're elevated. But their job is, that's your immune system. 
Then we have our platelet. And our platelets, well, we know what platelets are. They are what causes the clot. Platelets are like little porcupines. When they get aggravated and they get mad, they poke out. And when they poke out, they have little, they're like little stars or little cacti. And that's what grabs onto other platelets, other red blood cells, and other things to cause a clot formation. And we'll talk about the clotting cascade because we have intrinsic and extrinsic pathways that control that blood clotting. But it goes back to how those platelets react and how they activate. And when those platelets actually activate, that's what's going to cause that clotting cascade to take place and that blood clot to form, whether or not the blood clots should be there or not. So red blood cells, uh, as we know, they don't have a nucleus, so they really shouldn't be called cells at all. Because they were, they were, they started out as 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 as, as red blood cells, but then they they kick those kick those guys out. They're uh, responsible for oxygen transport because they have hemoglobin on them, and hemoglobin attaches. And the amount of hemoglobin or the amount of oxygen that attaches is based on that Bohr effect and 2,3 DPG. <coughs> what the heck is 2,3 DPG? Let's open up our file cabinet from the summer. Two three DPG is what regulates the attachment of that oxygen onto that hemoglobin. All right, the high amounts it's not gonna it's not gonna attach. We have the right amounts, everything's gonna attach just the way it's supposed to be. And the Bohr effect. What is the Bohr effect? Well, Bohr is pressure, okay, and that's what we're talking about with atmospheric pressure. That's why. Where it's e is it easier to breathe at sea level or at 11,000 feet? It's easier to breathe at sea level because everything, the pressure is greater. We're at 760 millimeters of mercury of atmospheric pressure. As compared to if we go up in altitude, we may only be at 720, 730 millimeters of mercury worth of pressure. So therefore, we're not going to be able to pressurize or have that oxygen attach onto that hemoglobin like it's supposed to. And that's what that oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. Anybody remember what the oxygen he oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve is? <coughs> that has to do with that and how how readily available either oxygen attaches or detaches from the red blood cell. Okay. So the red blood cell is the most abundant cell in the body. We have more of them than anything else. Um, the other thing with red blood cells is that's obviously why blood is red, because we have more red blood cells. We have production of them that continues through life and is produced in the bone marrow. One cell, and that's one hemopoietic stem cell, it's going to become up last, is going to divide and make 16 red blood cells. So for every stem cell that gets kicked out, we're going to get 16 new ones that come off of there. The lifespan is about 120 days. That's how long they live. And after that, they die, they go to the spleen, they get chopped back up, and then we're going to make new ones. But we make new ones every day. That's just the way our life cycle and the span of these guys go. We're going to talk about some different types of anemias later on. Like we're talking about sickle cell anemia. Well, their average lifespan for a sickle cell is only about eh, 30 days. It's even that long. So you can see how that creates problems in our whole um, blood development. So erythropoiesis, we already talked about that. What triggers the release of more red blood cells? What's that hormone? We talked about it a few minutes ago. EPO, okay. Erythropoietin is what's going to cause the creation of more red blood cells. They die off based on hemolysis. They're going to hemolyze or destroy themselves, and that's when they're going to be broken down, and they're going to sequester. In our red blood cells, we have a large number of them that sequester in our liver and in our spleen, specifically in the spleen. They sequester. Just think about sequester like being a jury being sequestered. They're all held there and held there till they're needed. Okay. So when we talk about the laboratory analysis of red blood cells, we have the red blood cell count um, that's going to tell us the total number of red blood cells. The hematocrit is the concentration of cells in the blood. So that's meaning compared to we have 45% red blood cells and 55% plasma or vice versa. And then the hemoglobin. The hemoglobin is telling us exactly what percentage of that hematocrit is hemoglobin. 
Everybody with me so far? So white blood cells, white blood cells are responsible, uh, like I said, for our immune system and our immune response. They do this by margination, phagocytosis um, are, are the two main, main ways. What is margination? Well, margination is isolating whatever the infective particle is and keeping it out. Sometimes we have severe and extreme margination. And severe and extreme margination is an abscess, walling that, walling that bacteria or that infection off so that way it doesn't interfere and spread. And that's how they do that. And then they're going to basically undergo phagocytosis, which we see here on the, on the bottom picture there, what phagocytosis is. Basically, we have that particle that comes in, great just this little hand out there, sucks it into the cell, and it's going to destroy it. Like a little Pac-Man is what it is, running around eating off all those invading particles. How do you get rid of it? That's it. It's going to kill it that way and then it's going to die. And then another mast cell is going to eat it as it dies. and It's going to be filtered out through the kidneys as they go out. Yeah. So. so leukopoiesis, erythropoiesis is the creation of red blood cells. Leukopoiesis is the creation of white blood cells. All right. In our different granulocytes, we have the neutrophil, basophil, and eosinophil. Like I said, they're called granulocytes because they're full of granules. Uh, this picture, these are mast cells, not really granulocytes, but they still have some granules in them. And you can see the little, these little purple dots that are in these cells, those are granules. And those are chemical mediators that are housed inside of them. Then we have our lymphocyte. Um, and our monocytes. Lymphocytes, again, are very important for our immune system. They're the ones that have the memory. They remember the things that come in. These guys are just little fighters is what they are. And then we have our monocytes. And the monocytes we've already talked about, the monocytes are a little Pac-Man that go and munch everything up and get rid of them that way. <coughs> so, immunity our immunity is based on, like we talked about a few minutes ago, T cells and B cells. Or our T lymphocytes, or thymus lymphocytes, and B bone marrow lymphocytes. The T cells develop cellular immunity, while the B cells produce humoral immunity. What is humoral immunity? Humoral immunity means you develop it. You develop it by exposure and through what you get. Cellular immunity is it's already been passed on to you. Okay. Your mama gave it to you. Right? It, pa it was passed down through, through the times. That's why whenever um, you're born, you don't die as soon as you come out. You've got some of your mom's immune system in you. Right? The other you have to develop on your own. Your mom may not have had the strongest immune system. You have, may have a much stronger immune system than what your parents do. That's based on your B cells or your moral immunity that you develop. With these, and along with immunity, we have our autoimmune diseases. Examples of autoimmune diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, myasthenia gravis can be clumped into that category. Lupus, those are all some very, some of the more common um, autoimmune diseases that we see. But what does an autoimmune disease mean? The body is attacking itself, right? The body is destroying itself for some reason and views whatever it is as being a foreign, not good entity. For instance, rheumatoid arthritis. What does it view as being a threat? The joints. It views those joints as being bad, so it, those cells come, on, come upon and they attack them and break them down and destroy them. And that's how it works. It's based on the body having some programming glitch and making it attack itself. Alterations in the immune process, many things will alter our immune process. Um, being sick, being stressed, being exposed to things, drugs that we take, medications we take, lifestyle effects, sleep patterns, all of those are going to alter our immune process and how that immune system is going to respond to invaders that come in. And we have our inflammatory process. What is the inflammatory process? Well, okay. Sweat. 
Okay, an inflammatory process is its way of dealing with whatever's foreignly, foreignly coming in. And I want to, it's, it's the complement system. And I want you to think about something. If you cut your hand, what happens when you cut yourself? You start to bleed, right? When you start to bleed, then what do you notice? Your hand starts to swell, right? And it gets red around there. And then you start to get warmth around that area. And the swelling continues, and it may wall off just a little bit. All of that is based on that complement or inflammatory response. What's going on there is the pain is released by prostaglandins that come out of those mast cells. What do the prostaglandins do? Those prostaglandins are what cause pain. Why do we have pain? Leave me alone. Let me heal. It's a true reason why. Okay. The second thing that goes along with that, we get the swelling. Why do we have swelling there? Right, it's an inflammatory process that happens, but it's there, the swelling is there to, to help get things there where we need to, to help isolate what's there so that those cells can start to work and do their repair of the damaged tissue. Besides getting that, then we notice we get warmth there. What is the warmth there for? Well, it helps increase the metabolism, which we increase the metabolism, we increase healing. The other thing that it does with the heat is it kills anything that's trying to come in. That heat that's right around that area is going to, it's not going to be normal, uh, ideal conditions, not 98.6 degrees. It may be 102, 103 degrees, which for that, why you may think, well, that's not enough to kill anything. You're not right. It's not enough to kill anything necessarily. But a temperature of 102 and 103, do you really want to do a whole lot of stuff when it's 103 degrees? No, and neither does these bacteria or other particles. They're not going to thrive. They may be able to survive, but they're definitely not going to be out running marathons. Okay, and those are the whole. Those are all reason, uh, parts of the inflammatory process of what's going on, and the body's trying to protect itself and, and repair itself, basically. It's inflammation. Now, anybody know how you can suppress the inflammatory response? Ice. Well, ice suppresses it, and something else. Drug, medication. Uh, it's an anti-inflammatory, um, so it, 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 it suppresses it, and then steroids. Steroids are anti-inflammatories. So you give steroid, it's going to reduce that inflammation. Oh, steroids slow down healing process. That's what it's like. Mm -hmm. That way you won't give like corticones, steroids, whatever, to somebody who's already sick. That is correct. I'll explain that in a second, yes. Okay, I have a question. When uh -huh. I was younger, uh -huh. I had really good computer tonsillitis, and I didn't swell, and all my teeth were fine. I only had to do with some kind of steroids mm -hmm. to do That's right. Okay. So that, that was to make sure that you could breathe. Yeah. Realizing it was going to take longer to get over that infection, but it's the risk with the benefit. And that's the same oh, thing okay. when, we, when we, that's the same thing that we talk about, like when you were just asking this, like when we give like steroids to people that are having difficulty breathing, all right, it reduces that inflammation, that's how it works. But if you have somebody that's immunocompromised, immunosuppressed, or already has a severe infection, what you've basically done is you just basically told the immune system to go piss off, and now it's, you know, it is what it is. Okay? Inflammation is still mast cells. <laughs> Inflammation is based on mast cells and those other chemical mediators as well that are inside those granule sites. So within the body, that would be mast cells. Well, <laughs> can be good in the lungs as well but the point is is you've got to subside it to sometimes improve the process so like if you used to have something on your leg you, you don't want it's not going to really affect your ability to function it's not going to affect your heart pumping it's not going to affect your um, your ability to breathe however if you have something in your like in her case her throat swelling shut well yeah we're going to suppress that we're going to suppress the body's ability to fight that off but if there's no swelling there she's going to be sick and uncomfortable for a little bit longer but the swelling's gone and now she can breathe same thing if it's in the lungs because when we think about it like an inflammatory process like asthma is the lungs inflamed in the asthma yes. it's not bacterially inflamed it's inflamed based on leukotrienes those leukotrienes being released as a chemical mediator we suppress that breathing's going to get better So platelets, 
we have uh, different categorizations of, uh, of platelets. We have mega kerasites, thrombocytopenia, and thrombocytosis. Uh, mega kerasites are huge, large platelets. They're dysfunctional platelets. They don't really work the way that they're supposed to. Thrombocytopenia, on the other hand, that means we don't have enough platelets. Our platelet levels are low. Which our platelet levels are low, it's going to affect our ability to clot, correct? Right. And then thrombocytosis is an overabundance of, uh, of platelets. Now, thrombocytopenia, if we don't have enough platelets, it's going to affect our ability to clot. But how does thrombo, uh, how do the platelets clot? Are they actually forming a real good blood clot or what do they form? The platelets themselves form a little bubblegum clot is what they do. It's soft, it's gelatinous, it stops the bleeding. It's not until it, we actually get our scab that we actually have the complete control of the bleeding. And that's when fibrinogen wraps itself around those platelets and ties it all together. So thrombocytopenia, we're going to bleed easier. Thrombocytosis, on the other hand, we may excessively cough. Um, you know, but that's going to put you at a higher risk of having things like a DDT or anything in those lines. Because we have all those platelets there, if you have too many platelets running around, they're going to start bumping into each other. What did I tell you happened whenever they got pissed off? They're like little porcupines, and then when they stick their little spines out, the other one sticks their little spines out, and then they start that whole little clot formation that makes, that makes its way. Okay? So controlling blood loss, vascular spasms um, is one way. Um, if you've, ever, if you've ever seen anybody that's had an arterial bleed or has amputated anything, you can actually see that vascular spasm taking place. What happens is it sits there and it clamps itself down, and it's its way of trying to control the bleeding. It doesn't work very well, though, obviously, because it's still open. The other thing that you notice, like especially in an amputation, you'll notice that not only is there spasming going on, but what you see happen is you see that that, that vein, or, or rather that artery, is going to suck up into the tissue itself to try to, to hide and isolate itself. And that's its way of trying and its own weird way of thinking of controlling the bleed. If I spasm down and I suck up in, I'm not going to bleed as bad. Platelet plugs, we just talked about what platelet plugs are, the little bubblegum clots, and then we get our stable fiber and blood clot. And a stable fiber and blood clot is what's going to sit there and it's going to control that bleeding and then it's going to continue to develop and move forward and move on. So hemostasis, there you can see an example of hemostasis and how that goes down. We have our broken blood vessel wall. Uh, we can start to see that we're starting to bleed out. We see our little platelets in there. Those platelets are going to activate like little porcupines, and that's what's going to hold all of that stuff together. And it's going to hold those red blood cells and other platelets together until fibrin can come in. And when that fibrin comes in, going to tie all of that together and that way we have our good clot that's formed and immediately as soon as that's formed it's going to start to dissolve away as this starts to heal and close and mend itself. All right. So there's the clotting clot cascade and you can see that there's two pathways. There's the extrinsic pathway and the intrinsic pathway. The extrinsic pathway is what you commonly think of. That's when you cut yourself and you're bleeding externally. You have tissue damage that takes place. The platelets are going to start to aggregate or come together and form together. And then those chemicals are going to come out. And then we have prothrombin activator, which is going to activate prothrombin, converting it to thrombin. Then thrombin comes out. Thrombin is going to activate fibr uh, fibrinogen, which is going to actually cause that actual full clot formation. And then fibrinolysis is going to start to take place, and that's uh, managed by plasmin. And plasmin gets in there, and that's what starts, it's like a little weak acid that's going to sit there and start to break down that clot. So that way, eventually, where you had a scab, eventually that scab's going to go away, and what's going to be there? New skin or new growth. Okay? That's the extrinsic pathway. One thing I want you to see is what do we have here? We have calcium. You cannot clot if you don't have adequate amounts of calcium in your blood. Calcium is required for every step along the clotting cascade. Calcium is essential. Without it, you don't clot. So is that what? Like the food is and all that? No. 
what they will affect is they're going to affect uh, they're going to affect the stages of plotting. Um, uh, uh, the uh, the PT is going to affect stage one, and then PTT is going to affect stage two, which we're going to talk about that in just a little while, and how that actually works. But it doesn't affect the calcium. What it affects is the actual per thrombin, is what it what affects in the development of that thrombin. thrombin. Um, the intrinsic pathway, as we see over here, the platelet damage happens. So that, when we talk about an intrinsic pathway, that's like a DVT. Somebody is sitting there, stagnant, not moving around, they start to get that form. Or if it gets up in the heart, um, like if you have a plaque buildup and those platelets are going through there, we have that turbulent blood flow. And that turbulent blood flow basically means everything is spinning around in there. That's going to kick off one of those platelets. As that platelet gets tipped off, it's going to activate. As it activates, it's going to have the porcupine effect, and it's going to start to make a clot form. Even though there's nothing, there's no blood being escaped, it's just mad, So as they, but it's still going to make that clot or that, um, that thrombus. And that thrombus is going to be intern internally. So then the platelet aggregation is going to start, mm -hmm. and then the chemicals are going to go down the same exact pathway. And that's what we're talking about when we have an intrinsic clot. So an extrinsic clot means we cut ourselves, we're bleeding, or we're bleeding internally because of something was damaged, and we're trying to plug the hole. Intrinsic basically means we're just passing along. Something activated that platelet. That platelet mm -hmm. got activated. Now we have a huge clot that forms. Does that, that kind of make sense? So intrinsic is not good. <coughs> no, intrinsic is not good. That's like a DVT. So where am I? Or a ischemic stroke, or anything in those lines. <laughs> All right, so now let's talk a little bit about blood products and blood typing. Uh, our blood types we have A, B, AB, and O. All right, and those are based off of antigens in our blood. All right, everybody know your blood type? Okay. All right. So AB is the best to be because you are the universal recipient. That means o you can, huh? O is a universal donor. AB is a universal recipient. That means you can take blood from anybody. You can take A blood, you can take B blood, you can take AB blood, or you can take O blood. Gotcha. Okay? Now, if you are O, you are the universal donor. That means anybody can take your blood. What O basically means, ladies and gentlemen, is think as O being a zero. Because what it means is there are no antigens. You are antigen free. You don't really have a blood type. You're just, you have blood. Okay? So, <laughs> so your universal donor again is the O. Um, and that's what they take it. Um, RH factor. RH factor really isn't that important unless you're a girl, okay? And that's what determines positive or negative, all right? For guys, it really doesn't matter if you're A positive or A negative or anything else like that. It does matter, though, if you're a lady, and I'll explain to you why here in just a minute. It has to do with kids, that's right, all right? So when we talk about these, these different blood types that we get here, um, we all understand allergic reactions and anaphylaxis a little bit, all right? But when we talk about these in these lines, anybody in here had a blood transfusion before? Okay. If you've never had a blood transfusion before, I can give you my blood, you can give me your blood, we can have just a big old blood mix and party together, all right? And nothing's going to happen. Yeah, maybe there's some diseases involved, but really nothing's going to happen, okay? Nothing's going to happen because nothing's there until the next time you have a blood transfusion, okay? Because then you've created antibodies for those antigens. You don't have any antibodies for those antigens right now because your body doesn't has never seen them before. So it's all good. If you've ever watched shows like MASH or anything like that, old stories, like the old war stories or old medical shows, they used to just, whenever, whenever a, a soldier or somebody else needed a blood transfusion, they just hooked themselves up to them. Okay, there'd be a direct line coming out of the doctor into the patient. Okay, that's how they used to give blood. Because they didn't have, there was no ability to store blood. Most of those people had never had a blood transfusion in their life. So given the blood, there it goes. It only becomes a problem later after those antibodies are developed. 
And that's where those antibodies come into play. The, when we have a blood transfusion, what, what's going to happen with this is patients are going to, you're going to have, the, the patient's blood is going to be drawn. They're going to be determined what kind of blood type that they are, whether they're A, B, A, B, or O. That is determined. Then, basically, you can get, just get some blood and take it down there once you determine what it is. But what's even better to do is what we call a cross match. And what a cross match basically means is you're going to take the person's blood who's going to get the blood transfusion. You're going to determine what type they are. Then you're going to take the donor blood. You take that donor blood and you make sure that they match up and what blood type they are. Then what you do is you mix them together. And then you watch them under a microscope to make sure that you don't have a little... It's basically like watching celebrity death match under a microscope. You see all the cells. Are they going to react well together? Are they going to play nice in the sandbox? Or are they going to sit there and they're going to try to kill each other? And that's what a cross match is. All of this takes time, though. So that's obviously like when we talk about trauma patients or people that need emergency transfusions, what do they get? They get O negative blood. Or if nothing else, if we know that they're A negative, we just say, bring us some A negative blood. All right? That's what we do. But ultimately, if you know that you're going to have a blood transfusion and you've got a little time for it, that's what you want to do. You want to do the whole cross match procedure. Right. Now, talking back uh, a little bit about RH factor. RH factor is based off the wrist monkey. And you guys all know what a wrist monkey is? A little, little funny looking little monkey guys? All right. What they did is they took back in the 40s, they took blood from a wrist monkey. And they basically reacted with it. If, you're, if the blood reacted with the wrist monkey serum, then it was positive. If it didn't react, it was negative. And that's what gives you positive or negative. For guys, it really doesn't matter. For ladies, however, it does. And the reason why it matters for ladies is fetal demise. Okay, the fetus is already looked as it looked at as being a, 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 a parasite. The body wants to destroy it and get rid of it. This just gives it more fuel. Now, with the first pregnancy, it doesn't matter. Okay, the first pregnancy, whatever. Okay, so if you're um, if you're A negative, all right, it's good. If you have a A negative baby or even an O negative baby, there's no problem with that, okay, because it's negative. But let's say you become pregnant and you're A negative and your baby happens to be A positive or O positive or AB positive, whatever. You have that come in there. Well, basically, you now have developed antigens for that. So what's going to happen is the next time you get pregnant, you're going to get what? You're going to you're going to you're going to attack that that fetus if it's a positive fetus, which most likely it will be. All right. So that's why after a woman gives birth, if we know that she's delivered at a positive baby and she's a negative, they're going to give them a Rogam shot. And that Rogam is basically going to erase all of the, that memory of that antigen so that way the next time she's pregnant, it doesn't kill that fetus. But it also becomes a problem and a consideration into the fact of when we give a transfusion to a lady. Because we don't want to give A positive blood to an A negative woman because then she's going to have the positive, the positive antibodies of that RH factor that's going to be there circulating around. Now, even for guys, we still do A negative. If you're A negative, you're going to get A negative blood. But realistically, it's not really going to have much effect on you at all. It's only going to have an effect on the female. Does that, does that make sense? Well, yeah, you just like to be difficult. That's exactly it. Yeah. So we want to give type-specific blood. Now, there are different types of reactions. And transfusion reactions. As a paramedic, realize you can't administer blood. All right, you're going to take transfers when patients are going to have blood. So you need to understand what a transfusion reaction is. Realize there's lots of different trans transfusion reactions. There's very mild ones, and there are very hard. They're going to kill you reactions. Okay. There are several things that come into play when we talk about a transfusion reaction. If you went and donated blood and you were kind of sick. You have bacteria and viruses that are in your blood. Okay, they're going to sit there in the blood bank while there's your blood sitting there storing, and it's going to continue to 
reproduce and regenerate and make a higher, higher concentration. So then when the blood gets transfused, what have we just introduced into the patient? An active infection, all right, that is going to cause an inflammatory response, okay? That's why temperature is always monitored very, very closely when we're giving a blood transfusion for multiple, for other reasons as well. The other type of transfusion reaction we sometimes see that is very mild is a sodium citrate reaction. Sodium citrate, anybody know what sodium citrate is? If you've ever drawn a blue top tube, you notice that there's a bunch of liquid at the bottom of a blue top blood tube, that's sodium citrate. It's a preservative and it also keeps blood from clotting. Sodium citrate is what's used whenever you donate blood. That is what, that's what the preservative in the blood is. All right, sodium citrate causes a little bit of a reaction to some patients. What it'll do is it causes the back of the throat to get cold. It'll cause their temperature to fluctuate just a little bit and they'll kind of get a lightheaded feeling. A very benign effect, but it's uncomfortable to the patient when it first happens. Then we have what we talk about with a real reaction, which is a hemolytic reaction. And a hemolytic reaction is exactly what it sounds like, hemo hemolysis. Basically, it's the little war going on inside there that I talked about we were looking at under the microscope. Instead of being in the microscope now, it's in the body. And basically, those, those cells are killing each other, and they're destroying each other. The antigens are sitting there, and the antibodies are attacking. So what you see with a hemolytic reaction is you see facial flushing, hyperventilation, tachycardia, they'll have hives, chest pain, wheezing, fever, chills, and cyanosis. They're having an anaphylactic reaction is what they're having. It's anaphylaxis. So your treatment is stop the transfusion, uh, change all IV tubing, and initiate IV therapy with normal saline or LR. Give them some furosemide to flush it out of their system and get it out. Consider dopamine for blood pressure support and give them some Benadryl, and you give them some Tylenol for the fever. That's how you deal with a transfusion reaction, all right? Your first and foremost thing, whenever you give blood, how many of you have given blood before? Okay, when you're given blood, there's things that you do. Obviously, you check the wristbands. You make sure that the wristbands match up to the bag. You make sure everything matches up. You verify your patient, all right? The next thing that you're gonna do is you're gonna take your baseline vital sign. And baseline vital signs are what you're going to write. And you're going to take vital signs every 15 minutes on the, on the dot, no questions asked. And that includes blood pressure, pulse, respirations, and a temperature. If you see any fluctuation in their vital signs whatsoever, obviously you're probably going to see their blood pressure start to go up. But if you start to see them becoming tachycardic, or specifically the first thing that you typically will see is a fever. If you see any of that, if you can see their temperature spike up by 2 or 3, uh, 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 degrees, you probably need to consider stopping the transfusion and figuring out what's going on. Because that's what your first warning sign is going to be to a transfusion reaction. All right? Transfusion reactions kill people. All right? It's not like, oh, I'm kind of sick. Like, we do this, we're hoping that this fixes the patient. A lot of times it doesn't. If the wrong blood has gone into the patient and the patient's having a transfusion reaction, the patient's probably going to die. So that's why we take such a big, so many steps. That's why we don't really initiate blood on our own in EMS. It's a truly a risky and dramatic business. Like um, there are lots of hospitals that, you know, obviously the nurse is going to initiate the blood, but there's nobody but the actual lab people themselves that will come draw for the transfusion, like come draw for the cross match. They won't trust a lab tech drawing the blood or even the nurse drawing the blood. That's how serious, how serious of a thing this is. Now, lots of things out there that we can do in medicine to kill people. This is one of them. And being careless is the biggest way. If you're not careless with this, there's no, there's no reason why anything should happen. The other type of reaction I talked about was the febrile non-hemolytic reaction. This is just the kind of mild uh, reaction. Uh, there's probably some type of infective property in there. Oh, and on that last slide too, in on this slide, anytime we discontinue blood, we don't throw the bag or the tubing away. Um, we always send it back to the blood bank because number one, even if the transfusion's through, they still need it for their storage and so forth and their records. The second thing that goes along with that is if they did have any type of reaction with that, they're going to have to retest that blood. So if it happened to be infected, they're going to blood cult. They're going to do blood cultures and all that other stuff to see what actually was infected in there. And that way they can test it. 
But when we talk about a febrile non-hemolytic reaction, they're going to have headache, fever, and chills, stop the transfusion, change your IV tubing, start saline or lactated ringers, give them some Benadryl, uh, consider giving them an antipyretic, and just watch them closely to make sure that it doesn't become a hemolytic reaction. It's going to kill them. Uh, well, part of that, part of that is that, and part of that too is the way the kidneys are filtering things um, as those antibiotics go through, uh, and it creates kind of a, a, a pyretic reaction, is what you call it. Um, but, but it'll subside after a little bit of time. But it's kind of the same. It's kind of the same principle on the same lines. But it just basically has to do with the fact that the kidneys aren't compensating as well as they need to. So. So general assessment management with these patients, uh, scene size up, your initial assessment, just like always. Uh, sample history, realize that the hematological emergency is really going to be the chief complaint, and realize that that's not going to be probably the diagnosis that we're going to make. These are going to be chronic conditions when we talk about um, uh, hematological emergencies. It's going to be something chronic that they're already diagnosed with and they're probably already being treated for. It's not something that we're going to discover today off of that 911 call. You always want to make sure to evaluate nervous system function because a lot of these hemolytic diseases are going to have an effect on the nervous system. So your general assessment, physical findings, skin signs, uh, what does the skin look like? Do we have any jaundice there? Um, we look at his eye there. We notice that this guy is jaundice. Right? Um, that's going to be an indicator that something's probably wrong with his what? Liver. But also realize it can be a sign of hematological diseases as well. Because inside your blood, you have bilirubin. Bilirubin is what's calling causes yellowing. If you have red blood cells and a bunch of your other cells that are lysing and exploding, you're going to have a release of bilirubin. Well, bilirubin can cause that. So that always needs to be something that's on your radar. <coughs> you have the GI signs, again, because we have the liver and the spleen that's involved. Muscular skeletal signs, uh, specifically in patients that have... Uh, um, uh, sickle cell anemia, if they're in a vaso-occlusive crisis, those vaso-occlusive things like to take place in the joints. So what you'll notice is they may have some joint pain or some severe joint pain. Cardiorespiratory signs, obviously it's affecting the blood, so we could be affecting oxygenation um, and lung function and heart function, and we could potentially have some genitourinary symptomology going on as well. You could have some hematuria, or their urinating blood, or uh, white blood cells, or numerous other so your general treatment is always on these guys is going to be supportive. There's not a whole lot you can do. You need to know these disease processes, but just understand that there's really not a whole lot you can do. They're chronic problems that have to be managed. But high flow oxygen and assist ventilation is needed, needed and continue give, consider giving them volume replacement. Because um, again, if it's affecting their blood, odds are they're probably going to need some volume. So give them some normal saline and some LR. Uh, monitor your cardiac rhythm and vital signs and treat any rhythm disturbances that you see just like normal. You're going to treat these patients just like you, like you normally would. Provide your reassurance and comfort and care and transport because, again, these are chronic conditions, not typically acute conditions. It may be a flare-up or it could be simply the fact that they got something else going on um, and they have a history of this, which is going to affect your care of the patient. So we're going to talk about diseases of the red blood cells, diseases of the white blood cells, the platelets and the blood clotting abnormalities and other hematopoietic disorders. So anemia is a sign, not a separate dis disease process. And I want you to remember that. Um, signs and symptoms may not be present until the body is stressed out. Uh, and that's the key. Because as long as things are going fine, everything's well, we're not really stressing our body out too much, the body's going to compensate very well. But at a time of stress, like let's say somebody that goes, um, takes off running and doesn't normally run, they may discover at that point in time that they've got a problem. Or anytime somebody becomes tachycardic or anything else like that, they're already compensating, so they're not going to have that ability to continue compensating. So that's one that's going to trigger that maybe I have a problem and maybe that's what I need to see. Um, but realize there's acute anemia and there's chronic anemia. And we're going to talk about those different categories. Acute anemia is... Right now, it's happening. The number one cause of acute anemia is blood loss. Blood loss. Okay. Then we have different types of chronic anemia, which we're going to talk about a little bit. All right. 
So let's go ahead and take a break there, and then we'll get into the anemias. <laughs> Let's continue on uh, with anemias. Like I said, anemia is a sign, not a separate disease process. There are different categories of anemia, and the process itself is what actually causes that. So, um, the most common cause of anemia is what we call an iron deficiency anemia. Um, because again, if we don't have the iron, we don't have the ability to have the hemoglobin, so therefore we're not going to have the ability to carry oxygen. And that's what anemia's primary problem is. We don't have the number of red blood cells or the hemoglobin to carry the oxygen around, so what are we making our patient become? Hypoxic. Okay. They are in a state of inadequate tissue perfusion, which is also known as shock. They're chronically in shock, for lack of a better term, because they don't have that. So excessive loss of iron can come from two different sources. It can either be uh, from bleeding. Um, so how are we going to fix that? Stop, it. Stop the bleeding and then replace the fluid. Or for malabsorption. How can we fix malabsorption? LR is going to fix malabsorption? <laughs> how about just iron supplementation? Give them some extra iron pills. A little iron in their diet. All right. Oh, I thought you were doing like emergency. So that's nothing yet. Yeah, that's not emergency. It's going to be a long term. If it's for malabsorption, yeah, it's going to be a chronic condition they're going to have to fix. Now, if it's from bleeding, obviously, we're going to we're going to flood the, stop the bleeding, give them fluid replacement to hold them over until they can get a blood transfusion, and they can get their red blood cells back up to the normal range where they need it to be. Uh, but for malabsorption, there's not really a whole lot we can do acutely because again, that's going to be a chronic problem, and they're going to have to have dietary changes and supplementation to actually make sure that they're getting the the amount of iron that they. <laughs> so then we have our megoblastic anemias, which are B12 deficiency, folate deficiency. Um, megoblastic anemias, think about it like that, they're, they're huge cells. That means these cells are too large to be functional. And we talk about in the, a little bit later on in lab value interpretation, that's where like we look at RDWs and so forth in terms of the red blood cell size. That's what that's related to. Because you'll see that these cells are larger. They're too large to be functional. B12 deficiency is exactly that, not getting enough B12. If they don't get enough B12, they're not gonna, the, the red blood cells are not going to be healthy enough to sustain and hold on to that hemoglobin. Well, go ahead. Yeah, same thing. Uh, because it, B12 does multiple things, but it, it increases your metabolism and your metabolic drive. And it increases your ability to oxygenate. Makes your red blood cells healthier. B12 makes your blood, red blood cells healthier. Uh, folate, uh, having a deficiency in folate, uh, specifically folic acid, um, also affects uh, the ability to carry oxygen and for your red blood cells to, to have the function that they need. Um, so those are two, again, they're, they're chronic problems. They're not acute. There's nothing you're going to do to fix them. Uh, they are just simply going to have to uh, get those things fixed by regulating their diet and by supplementation. It could be related to poor absorption. Poor absorption in their body, their GI tract just is not able to, to absorb these things. Or again, they're just not getting enough in their diet. So again, the only way to fix it is to, is to give them some supplementation. <coughs> anemia of chronic diseases uh, causes renal failure, will cause anemia. How do you think renal failure would cause anemia? Well, remember kidneys produce EPO, right? Erythropoietin. They're not if the kidneys are failing, they're not going to be producing erythropoietin. So therefore they're not and everything's not getting filtered through there, so they're going to become they're going to lose their red blood cells. Basically, they're not going to be picking up enough of them off. Um, infections. Some of our infections will actually affect uh, the uh, the production of red blood cells. And also think about too, if the bone marrows have to kick out a whole bunch of uh, hemopoietic stem cells for white blood cells, 
they're really going to be taking the time and the concentrated effort to produce the ones for red blood cells. There's going to be that trade-off somewhere. Malignancies obviously uh, can affect and attack those red blood cells and destroy them, uh, making them um, making us have a shorter number, and sometimes we lose them faster than we can reproduce them. So, um, an RA or rheumatoid arthritis also will destroy red blood cells because um, uh, RA as it develops and continues to go on, not only does it affect the joints, but it also will lead into what we call a vasculitis or an inflammation of the vascular system, which will also destroy those red blood cells. Um, and so a lot of times the anemia is based on their inability to recycle iron. That iron's there, but they just don't have the ability to recycle it um, and use it so it's all eliminated. So when it comes time to build it up, there's none there. Like in kidney failure, erythropoiesis is slow because we don't have the kidneys producing EPO to tell our bone marrow to kick out more red blood cells. Um, cytokines or chemical mediators out of our uh, white blood cells. Um, these are part of our natural immune system are sometimes released and they will slow down or completely halt erythropoiesis. What are you going to do for these kind of patients? Nothing. Support their symptoms. What do all of these patients that have anemia need? Blood. blood. In the absence of not being able to give them blood, what do we give them? Blue. Okay, what if their blood pressure is fine? Oxygen. They need oxygen because they don't have enough buses to carry the oxygen around. So we want to make sure that the buses that they do have are fully loaded to get that oxygen delivered to the places where it needs to go. The renal failure patients, you mean? <laughs> well, well, both. Yeah, they, they do actually. They do sometimes give them EPO. Yeah, but again, that's only it's only gonna last as long until they have to have another shot. So many times, that's why we don't run on them to always be anemic because, and they'll give them iron and other supplementations. Patients that are well cared for and have the supplementation that they need are not gonna have problems. It's gonna be the patients that aren't getting the supplementation that they need that are gonna have those issues. So hemolytic anemia, um, or just when you think things can't get any worse, um, we have an enzyme defect with G6PD, all right, which we talked about that, which has to do with our ability for oxygen to attach onto cells. And basically when the patient gets stressed out, it's going to cause that cell lice. So basically that cell explodes. Um, so basically in times of stress, these patients that have hemolytic anemia, their red blood cells will just basically explode. Um, and then they lose them. And they're usually not creating them fast enough to correct them. And the other side effect of hemolysis is like what we already talked about. Not only are we hemolyzing and losing the ability to carry oxygen, all of those contents inside that cell are being released, which up to includes bilirubin. So we have bilirubin being released out into the body. We have all the extra potassium, all the extra sodium that should be inside that cell, outside of the cell now, as well as all, all of the other substances that are inside that cell and they're not in the right place. They're outside, so now they're going to create irritation and other problems in other body systems. And we really call them jaundice and high. Mm -hmm. It's not true jaundice. Yeah, well, it is true jaundice because it's bilirubin. Uh, bili that, that is what jaundice is, is bilirubin. Typically speaking, we think of bilirubin, we think about jaundice as being a liver failure sign, but it's not always a liver failure sign. It is also a sign of anemias in some of our blood, blood clotting disorders. Bilirubin is not only a sign, but there is symptoms with it? No, bilir uh, bilirubin is a chemical. Just the chemical. Bilirubin is a chemical. Jaundice is a sign. Being jaundice is a sign of having bilirubin. Okay. Um, well, hemolytic anemia, hydration is a key. Uh, but usually what they have to do is they have to go in there and they have to cut out the spleen uh, to, get, to fix it. So, but like I said, just giving them hydrated, keeping them hydrated, keeping them well. Oftentimes we'll do it if you have a patient that's got a history of hemolytic anemia and they're having an exacerbation of the symptoms, giving them IV fluids many times will, will be the key to, to correct. So when we talk about lytic anemias, it's acquired versus congenital. Acquired meaning they caught something that made it happen. Congenital meaning they were born with it and it's just your genetic coding. It could be a misshapen RBC or misshapen red blood cell. It could be sickle cell anemia. 
Uh, chicken cell anemia is considered to be in the classification of lytics. Uh, a cold agglutin. What is a cold agglutin? Anybody heard of cold agglutin before? Cold agglutin basically means whenever your blood, whenever you get cold or your blood gets cold, it all clumps together. And then as it warms back up, it separates back out. Okay? Causes quite a bit of problems, but it's again considered to be a category of uh, um, lytic anemias. Toxins will cause lytic anemia. Snake bites, spider bites, drugs. Uh, we talk about like a rattlesnake venom. Rattlesnake venom is hemolytic, hemolytic uh, venom. What it causes to occur is it causes the red blood cells to explode in lice and it causes tissue necrosis. That's how it works. So as you can see, not only is a rattlesnake bite going to cause that tissue necrosis look at, look at the local site, in the long term and in the long run, it's going to cause those red blood cells to destroy and the patient's going to become anemic because those red blood cells get destroyed. Um, but remember, all in all, what are we dealing with here? And we're dealing with the inability for oxygen to be transmitted and fixed. And I fix this lecture every year, but I still always forget to take that. That tells you how long ago I wrote this lecture. Eric Mann was in paramedic school. So when we talk about when we talk about all this, again, it's all just a matter of supplementing oxygenation and giving them the oxygen that they need to suffice until the problem can be fixed because they again are in a chronically hypoxic state. Their cells are not getting the oxygen that they need. So aplastic anemia, aplastic anemia is bone marrow failure. The bone marrow is not doing its thing anymore. Uh, basically the bone marrow, the functional part of bone marrow is turning into fat. Uh, fat is getting in there, adipose tissue, which adipose tissue does not create red blood cells. Um, not real sure on what causes it. Many times uh, it can be uh, based on drugs, it can be congenital. Um, some uh, viruses and chemical exposures will also cause the body to become uh, or start to develop aplastic anemia. Um, supportive care uh, is going to be the, the key, and they're going to need blood transfusions. And they're going to need blood transfusions on a regular basis, probably for the rest of their life. They'll be showing up once a week or twice a week to the same day surgery center to get a blood transfusion until then write it out until till the end of time. So here we can see some different types um, of anemias just on this table here. We can see the inadequate production of red blood cells is based on a plastic, iron deficiency, pernicious anemia or B12 deficiency, and sickle cell. Um, increased red blood cell destruction, hemolytic, uh, the blood uh, the body destroys red blood cells or blood loss or dilution, chronic disease due to hemorrhaging. Um, another thing I'm going to touch on really quick is sickle cell anemia. What is sickle cell anemia? Misshapen red blood cells, they look like a little sickle. It affects African Americans and those of Mediterranean descent. Mediterranean descent means people from Greece, um, some, uh, some down from uh, in, anywhere in the Mediterranean region of the, of the world. Realize that Mala or, uh, uh, sickle cell anemia was, it was designed to be a protective mechanism for patients that, uh, to, to keep them from getting malaria. The body, that's a mutation that happened and developed. Basically, patients that have a sickle cell trait don't get malaria. Instead, they get sickle cell anemia. It's one of those, one of those crossover, trade one bad for another bad. Um, when we talk about patients that have sickle cell, we don't see it real commonly around here because we don't have the population that, that suffer from that, but you will see it from time to time. What you're going to see is there's lots of different problems that come along with, whether it be a vaso-occlusive crisis or a chronic pain, splenomegaly, or having a large spleen. Uh, because what happens is those cells are misshapen. Not only are those cells misshapen, those cells don't carry oxygen. They don't have the right hemoglobin on them. So what will happen is, as these sickle cells go through, we realize a lot of our veins and our, or rather our capillaries are so small in our body that they're only allowed for one red blood cell to go through in a single file line. Does that make sense? It's only one blood cell can go through in a single file line. So, and that's designed for a normal red blood cell. These guys are misshapen, they're hook shaped. So as they go through there, a lot of times what will happen is they'll grab on. And as they grab on into that capillary wall, they're going to create an obstruction. That obstruction is going to mean that anything on the other side of that is going to become what? 
for the disruption, and they're going to start to have tissue injury because they're hypoxic with that. It's going to cause pain. So a vaso-occlusive crisis happens there. A lot of times they'll also get large spleens, other problems that take two that puts them at a high risk of having strokes and MIs. Key to treatment for this for when we talk about patients that are having a, a, a single cell crisis is fluids and pain meds. Give them lots of pain meds and make them comfortable because they're going to be in a lot of pain and extremely uncomfortable and then giving them the fluids and hydrating them the best they can. It's a chronic condition. It's not anything acute, but they will have flare-ups or exacerbations. And it is an emergency. And they are going to be in, like I said, a severe amount of pain, especially if they're in a vaso-occlusive crisis. So again, talking a little bit more, we can see the picture there. Uh, could follow your general treatment guidelines. Mm -hmm. And again, fluids. Watch out. Uh, give them fluids and consider the pain meds. But you can see here on the side slide there that sickle cell it's completely misshapen, doesn't have any functionality. This one on the left carries oxygen. The one on the right does not carry oxygen. So that also means we have buses that are dysfunctional. There's no, they're just sitting there floating around, not doing anything, not doing any good for us. So polycythemia is overproduction of the erythrocytes. It occurs in our patients that are greater than 50 years of age or those that have secondary dehydration. Um, what we see with polycy, uh, polycythemia patients, very commonly in COPD patients, um, you, you see that a lot. Because if you think about a COPD patient, um, they're chronically hypoxic, right? If they're chronically hypoxic, their kidneys are gonna pick up on that. If they're picking up on that, what are the kidneys gonna do? They're going to produce EPO, which is going to go and make more red blood cells come out, try carrying around. It's all fine, well, and good because we've got more buses now to carry oxygen. But here's the problem with it. Now we've turned our blood into sludge, right? Instead of it being 55% uh, uh, plasma and 40, uh, um, you know, 50 50 mix, basically, we've got like a 70, a 70 30. So instead of pushing around 10 W30, they're pushing around, around 2050. All right, it's, it's heavier, it's thicker, it's harder on the heart. So that's where the problem with polycythemia comes into. Uh, what they'll start to see is they'll have epistaxis. The blood's got to find some way out. So they'll start bleeding from their nose. They'll bruise spontaneously. And very commonly, they'll have a uh, GI bleed. Again, they're looking for any way they can to eliminate some of this, some of this blood. Um, their management is going to follow general treatment guidelines. Uh, supportive care, comfort measures, oxygen. What they're really going to need is what we call a therapeutic phlebotomy. And a therapeutic phlebotomy basically means they go in, they hook them up like they're going to give a, do a blood transfusion, and they drain um, basically a couple of pints off of them, uh, the blood. And they have this done probably about once every couple of months or every month or so. No, no. Well, I mean, I guess it could be, but in this case, it's not. It's just pulled off and it's thrown away. They still got all that fluid in there. Got to get rid of it. Got to get rid of it. That's the only way to fix it. Leukopenia, neutropenia, uh, two few white blood cells or neutrophils. Um, when we first get an infection, what we see is the body will start to kick out high, a high number of neutrophils. Early on infection. So what we call a right shift. We see all of these neutrophils getting getting pumped out. Right? But over time, as that can, infection continues to, to run its course and those white blood cells are destroyed, what we start to see is they become neutropenic, where their white blood cells um, start, to, start to decrease in number. Um, general treatment guidelines are going to be what you're going to follow, IABCs, IVO2 monitor, follow supportive care. The, other, the one thing you need to remember, though, if you consider somebody that could be potentially leukopenic or neutropenic, is isolation precautions and reverse isolation precautions, meaning you're not protecting you, you're protecting the patient. So putting a mask on the patient, so that way they're not breathing in and getting everybody's infection, infectiveness. Good hand washing, good hygiene practices, making sure that the patient's clean, making sure if you're going to stick them with an IV, that your IV site is truly clean the right way, not uh, not there. What's going to, what do you think there are going to be some things that are going to trigger you in to think that maybe this patient could be uh, neutropenic? Huh? 
they look sick, okay? Look sick in history. You know, if they've got a history of uh, cancer, they have a history of infections, or anything like that, you may want to be considered the fact that they very well potentially could be neutropenic. Um, leukocytosis is an increase in the number of circulating white blood cells. It's, again, usually due to an infection. Uh, the problem is we get a leukomoid reaction. A leukomoid reaction basically means an over-exaggerated immune response. Um, fever, um, fever chills, kind of some of those same regard of what you were talking about with the inflammatory antibiotics, all those different antibiotics, the things that you see. Um, and again, it has to do with the kidney not being able to process and get through, get the stuff out as quickly as it probably should. Leukemia. Leukemia, of course, is cancer of the hemo, hemopoietic cells. Um, so there are different classifications of leukemia. Some leukemias are curable and treatable, while other leukemias are going to run their course and cause, cause death. Um, chronic myelogenous leukemia, or CML, is a chromosome abnormality. Um, and while acute myelogenous leukemia is a stem cell gone crazy. AML is not that bad. Because it's a stem cell, we isolate that stem cell, get rid of it, things will get better. Uh, we talk about chronic myelogenous leukemia, it's a chromosome abnormality, the body's going to continue to do this for the rest of its life. Okay. So their initial presentation for leukemia, they're going to be acutely ill, they're going to be fatigued, they're tired, uh, uh, febrile, they'll probably have some anemia that goes along with, and very weak. Now, oftentimes, when we find it is when they have secondary infection. They're, because they're going to have to draw blood and look at other things like that. Because leukemia in and of itself, when it first presents, you just think you're tired. It's not one of those things that, oh, I'm dying, the world's coming to an end. Sometimes they will have some bone pain and other things that go along with. But again, for the most part, it's just the, the, the weakness and lethargy. So follow your general treatment guidelines, a, a IVO2 monitor, supportive care, uh, and isolate them. You want to use isolation techniques to limit the risk of the infection. That's, the, that's one of the most important things that you can, you can possibly do. Because um, you don't want anything in because their immune system has crashed. And something as simple as uh, a common cold, if they're truly in a leukemia state, can actually kill them. Lymphomas, uh, cancer of the lymphatic system. Uh, so we have a cancer of a lymph node or the complete lymph system. What we'll see is swe swelling of the lymph nodes. Uh, you'll notice that they'll be swollen. So a lot of times they'll be hard to the touch. Um, sometimes they're painful, sometimes they're not. And that's usually one of the key signs of a lymphoma. Because if we're sick and we got a, an inflamed lymph node, it's usually painful. With lymphomas, a lot of times they're typically not. They can be painful, but usually they're they're just they're just large and um, and swollen. Um, they'll have the fever. Uh, night sweats is very common. Anorexia, weight loss, fatigue, uh, and itchy itchy skin. So follow your general treatment guidelines on that again. IVO2 monitor supportive care. Consider pain in if they are uncomfortable or in pain. And utilize your isolation techniques. You want to limit the risk of that infection as best as you possibly can. So, talking about the different types of lymphoma, there's Hodgkin's lymphoma and there's non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma originates in the lymphoid cells, or the, uh, the, the, lymph, the, the lymph, uh, lymph cells. Um, usually it's a single lymph node, but it can be global, meaning it affects multiple lymph nodes. Um, medical history. Um, if they've got any other chronic problems or any other health problems, it's only going to make them worse because, again, they don't have the immunity um, or the uh, inflammatory ability to, to, to respond to this and take care of it. It is a cancer, so it's supportive care primarily. Make them comfortable. If they're nauseated, give them something for nausea. If they're given fluid, give them oxygen, give them pain meds if they need it. Again, it's something supportive, nothing that you're going to fix. It's going to be chemo and radiation therapy that they're going to have to undergo and do. Hodgkin's disease, um, cancer of the lymphatic system. Uh, they will have uh, Reed Sternberg cells. That's the hallmark thing. If you're doing a, a, a blood test on them, you'll see those cells inside of their differential. It is very similar to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, 
Um, but usually these patients do better with, um, with Hodgkin's disease than they do with uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So supportive care is going to be your key, and they're going to have to go undergo lots of chemo. Again, many times they can get this to go into remission, and the patient will do okay, as long as it hasn't, had, as long as it hasn't metastasized to other body systems. As long as it's still isolated into the lymphatic system, they usually do, do okay. So multiple myeloma. Uh, no, it's not a whole bunch of German grandmas together. It is a malignant plasma cell which create excessive immunoglobulins. With these excessive immunoglobulins, we have an over-exaggerated immune system and we're going to have an over-exaggerated immune response. It's going to crowd the bone marrow out because these uh, plasma cells are just going to sit there and they're going to crowd out that bone marrow, which is going to make it very difficult to produce any more red blood cells or white blood cells. Um, cancer doesn't usually have a very good prognosis, um, but supportive care, IVO2 monitor, treat their nausea symptoms, treat their um, their uh, pain with some uh, uh, analgesics and things should be good. When we talk about platelets, we have thrombocytes, uh, thrombocytosis and thrombocytopenia. Thrombocytosis is an abnormal increase in the number of platelets, while thrombocytopenia is an abnormal decrease in the number of platelets. Um, both of these are going to give me chronic problems. Typically, thrombocytosis, again, you'll see that a lot of times. Something's going to activate and uh, over exaggerate the production of platelets. Thrombocytopenia, um, they could have bled out, lost their platelets that way. They could have an infection that's affecting that. Uh, infections such as Ehrlichia. Ehrlichia not only affects white blood cells, but it also destroys uh, the platelets. Uh, don't see Ehrlichia very commonly, but Ehrlichia is out there in the environment. Um, again, provide supportive care, follow your general treatment guidelines. Again, that's all you can really do. Um, either they got too many platelets or not enough. Keep them from bleeding. That's the big thing. So, hemophilia. Hemophilia is deficiency or absence of the blood clotting factors, specifically factor eight. Um, we have factor 8 and factor 9. Factor 8 is hemophilia A. Factor 9 is uh, hemophilia B. Um, guys are at higher risk for hemophilia. About 1 in 10,000 uh, uh, men have hemophilia. Women can get hemophilia, but it's extremely, extremely rare. The thing about women is you guys are the carrier. You guys carry it and pass it on to your offspring. Um, so that's how hemophilia works out. So, again, it is a sex-linked inherited disorder, and it's carried on the, the X chromosome. Um, but, again, you've got to usually have the, have the Y in there to, to really make it work and activate it. Um, hemophilia A, hemophilia B, really no, no differentiation in, in the two. Um, the way we see it, um, the way vector, or hemophilia A and B are, are going to be treated uh, is going to be based on that, on what clotting factor they need to give them. Because obviously, if it's hemophilia A, they're deficient in clotting factor 8. And if they have hemophilia B, it's uh, a deficiency in clotting factor 9. Um, what you'll see with this is uh, numerous bruises, deep muscle bleeding, joint bleeding. I can tell you if they have hemophilia, they were probably diagnosed with it a long, long time ago. Um, they've probably known it. It's not something we're going to diagnose in the field as being a new problem. And most patients do not develop hemophilia overnight. They were born with it and known they've had it since, since birth. Um, so our biggest concern when we talk about hemophilia is what? Clotting. Like if they have trauma, how hard is it going to be for us to make, to make the clotting stop? Um, and that's going to be one of the big keys that we're going to have to look at with this. Um, so the numerous bruises, um, again, are going to be there. And it's going to be very difficult for us to be able to make things stop because they don't have the ability to clot. Yeah, they have platelets. The platelets are still going to come out there and try to cause those bubbles and clots, but we're never going to get that fibrin clot that's going to form without giving them some type of cryo. So you can sit there and you can hold pressure till you're blue in the face, but it's still going to bleed and it's not going to stop. Do I now? I have someone that was cauterized. Uh, I. 
Yeah, I mean that will cauterizing will stop. Probably the not that permanent. Yeah, but it, it'll it'll seal it is what it'll do. That's what cauter cauterization does. Basically, seals it and forms that tissue to come together. But really, though, what they're going to have to do is definitely going to be a temporary fix too. Is they're going to have to give them some clotting factors. So they're going to have to give them some cryoprecipitate, which we talked about earlier, to actually introduce those clotting factors in there to make that blood clotting happen. So treat the patient similarly to others. Um, Administer supplemental oxygen, uh, establish IV access, uh, look for, for normal bleeding. If you suck at IVs, have your partner start the IV. Um, if you don't get it, don't get, sit there and turn them into a pink cushion because every one of those holes that you form is, is going to not bleed or is going to continue to bleed. Um, think about if you've ever started uh, an IV on somebody that's on aspirin therapy and how hard it is to get that, that bleeding to sock out of that IV sock. That's like 10 to 20 times worse. They're going to just sit there and continue to bleed, bleed, bleed. Blood clotting that would go worse. Less likely to have a heart attack and stuff like that? Um, yeah, because they're not going to, they are going to be less likely because things are going to stay slicker and they're not going to have the clot formation take place like it needs to. But, I mean, they can still get it. I mean, they still get the plaque and artery buildup, but there's typically is not going to be uh, thrombosis formed. It's going to be uh, by by the, the, the plaque deposits inside that coronary artery. Von Willebrand's disease, you don't develop uh, hemophilia overnight, but you can develop uh, Von Willebrand's disease later in life. Von Willebrand's de disease is a def deficient uh, deficiency in factor eight. Um, they will have excessive bleeding, um, supportive care, and you know, they'll treat it with uh, some cryo and some other clotting factors. Again, it typically is not a life-threatening emergency. It becomes a life-threatening emergency whenever you can't get the bleeding to stop or if they've got ble internal bleeding and it's not stopping. There's no way to see it. But again, most of the time these patients do fine and they'll just be on uh, uh, some medications to fix that and, and again, on seeing those clotting factors. Now let's talk a little bit about DIC. Now DIC uh, is a complex, complex thing. Um, how many of you have heard of DIC before? DIC stands for Disseminated Intervascular Coagulation. We don't see DIC in the field very often, not in the 911 setting. When we see DIC is on interfacility transfers, and we see DIC, you'll see DIC when you go to Lubbock, and you go up to the surgical ICU and the medical ICU. This is what happens three, four days later down the road after we had that level one trauma patient. All right, this is what the body's doing and this is how it's dealing with it. <coughs> to sum up what DIC is, is you're clotting where you shouldn't be clotting and you're bleeding where you shouldn't be bleeding. So you've got clots forming in your deep circulation that are sitting there spontaneously forming. But what we talk about inside of the, um, uh, when we talk about the, they're bleeding, they're bleeding from their eyelids, from their eyeballs, the corners of their eyes, through their gums, down their nose, through their pee hole, all of those places they've got blood coming out. So they're bleeding from places where they shouldn't be bleeding and they're clotting in places where they shouldn't be clotting. But it's an appropriate triggering of the coagulation cascade and a breakdown of the normal feedback and mechanism in the body that allows for the dissolution, uh, uh, dissolving of the clots. It is the oldest hypercoagulable state known to medicine. It's been around since Hippocrates' days. Uh, he, he talked about it. But again, it's been around for a very, very long time. Uh, it's evil stuff. So instead of getting a localized response, uh, we get all these mediators for, for clotting that are released into the circulation <coughs> that cause clotting all over the place. So we've got clots forming in our femoral artery. We've got for, clots forming in, down in our calf. Uh, we've got clots forming in our arms, uh, in our aorta, all of these places we have these big clots that are just sitting there forming. Um, so we have all this thrombi, um, and they consume all of these factors, these clotting factors, to develop these clots in there, which basically means when it comes time when we start bleeding from other places, we don't have the clotting factors there to make that blood clot take, take place. Well, along with creating all these fibrin clots, that are deep in the circulation, the body's natural response to that is to produce, yeah, fibrinolytics, okay, our natural fibrinolytics. So we have plasmin 
a plasminogen that gets released inside the body, which are there to dissolve the clot, which also means that we thin everything out and make it bleed even more. So it's kind of a double sword there. So DIC starts by the injured cell or endothelium activating the intrinsic clotting pathway that we talked about, something inside. Uh, the major thrombosis in the capillaries and deep veins uh, deplete the factors. Um, the stimulated fibrinolysis releases FDP, which is fibrinogen degradation products. So when we start to release that FDP, our fibrinogen degradation product, it triggers the more release of plasmin as well as a for the formation and dissol dissolving of those clots. Um, so we start to have AV shunting, um, which is going to cause the blood to become stagnant. And as blood sits there and becomes stagnant, what's going to happen? It's going to clot more and it's going to become acidotic because there's no gas exchange taking place. It's all sitting there. And this cycle continues to go around and around and around until it gets fixed or the patient dies. And a lot of times the mortality rate on this is about 70 to 80 percent. So if you actually get the DIC, um, you're probably you're, you're probably going to have a rough road to hope. So um, treatment methodology for DIC, um, there's a lot of experimental uh, medications out there. Uh, the injection of what they have found is the injection of uh, um, uh, uh, cortisol uh, actually actually helps with this. But really, there's not much you can really do other than just ride the wave. Try to keep them from bleeding out from the spots where they don't need to be bleeding out from. But at the same time, you want to try to dissolve those clots and get those clots to break down as best as you can. Yeah. Not only, no, there's other things that will happen to you. Other medical conditions, chronic medical conditions will, will also uh, induce uh, DIC. Okay, so it's the most common though? Maybe. Yeah, trauma is more the most common thing that you're going to see that's going to induce this. But any, any type of criticality or shock um, is going uh, is going to induce potentially DIC. Can this release some sort of fiber? Fibrinogen? Yeah, you start to... Oh, fibrinolytics. Yeah, you start to bleed out from your from your eyeballs and it, basically anywhere because there's no what ability for it to clot. It just starts seeping out and looking for ways out. Doing that originally to break down the clots from the correct. Whatever. That is correct. It's trying to break down the clots, and in that meantime, it's trying to break down the clots, start to get those other other things to start to ensue and settle themselves in. Okay. Uh -huh.